Good afternoon. Uh, let's see um, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, for those of you who have not picked up your midterm yet, I have them with me, so you can come after class. Number two, the solutions to the midterm have been posted. If you go under the exams section, you will find the solutions there. And most importantly, um, two more things. Obviously, it is homework due today, and we post a new one at the same time which is going to be due after spring break. So because of the fact there's plenty of things going on and also uh, given the material that's being touched in the next exam, uh, the next um, <coughs> homework is going to, we're not going to finish it by Friday. So it's going to run into the week after. That's why I give you some more time. You actually get two weeks, actually even three weeks for this particular homework. All right, uh, let's see, uh, project has been posted. So if you go to the project phase, it's all there. Um, not much have changed compared to what we discussed on Wednesday. With the only exception, uh, you will go now. If you go to the um, to the project web page, and then you will look at the project definition, you will find that uh, the filter we're going to design is a band stop filter, as I mentioned. And actually, the frequency response is going to be something like this. This is what we expect you to kind of create. If you look at it in the frequency domain. So it, it's a filter that passes most of the signals except in this particular notch here. It's also very often called a notch uh, filter, something that allows you to remove one single frequency. Uh, let's say that could be, let's say, for example, this could be 60 hertz, would help you to remove 60 hertz completely from the signal. Okay, that's an example of that. Um, there's, there's actually a fifth order filter, so it has actually. Um, um, five coefficients, uh, C0, A0, A1, A2, A3, and A4. Now, fortunately for you, two of them are zero, so you don't have to do those. That makes life a little bit simpler. And the other ones are implemented in such a way that if you look at the coefficients, you will see that each of them, you take them apart and you write them in binary form, you will see that they require three ones. Okay, so there's basically going to be three shifts Per coefficients, we have three coefficients, so there's going to be nine shifts approximately in the structure. Okay? So um, the cells, we have provided you cells to start your design with. So if you go there, there's instructions on where to find the cells. But we have provided you with a register cell and a um, adder cell. So let me just say one couple, um, just a couple of words on that. Let me just make a... Um, maybe we can go to the overhead camera for a minute. All right, thanks. Oops, let's go here. Let's get this out of the way and get this right in the middle. So, um, as we discussed last lecture, a adder, a full adder cell, that's the one we provide you, has two inputs, A, B, and CI, and has two outputs, CO and um, S, carry in, carry out, sum. Now the first thing you're going to have to do is kind of create a logical model or a timing model for this cell, which you can do by simulation. I would kind of, what I would like to be able to do is describe the delay at the two outputs, C, O, and S uh, with respect to each of the inputs. So there's three inputs, so there's going to be a delay from A to C, O, B to C, O, C, I to C, O. So what we like to have is a propagation line model that says T, P is equal to T, P, zero times um, 
1 plus fan out times a certain factor. Okay, logical effort really. So if you can find logical effort of this unit, you should be able to write down this equation. And um, everything else can then be expressed as, uh, as in function of this logical, or basically in function of this timing delay equation. Now remember, the delay from A to CO, B to CO, and CI to CO could be different. So for each of those paths, I have to develop a different timing model. Okay? And the same thing is true with S. Okay? You will see that A and B might not be very different, but obviously CI to CO might be a different ballgame, as will become clear in this lecture. Now, this project is mostly focusing on the design of adders. I don't want you to mess around with the registers in the project. They're, they're given, we're going to give you a high level model for them, so don't worry about this. Then. But there's one thing you have to know about registers that's important. All right, so what we have here, let's say, is a set of those register cells, sometimes eight, and that goes into logic, right? Something like this, and this might go here, whatever. I don't really care. So suppose this is your logical network. So these are registers. Obviously, when I look at this, I know right away where the critical timing path is going to be. It's going to be right here, right? That's my critical timing path. For each of those gates, could be full adder cells, if we have derived this thing here, we know what the delay could be, or what the delay is going to be. So the only question that you ask yourself, if I look at the propagation delay from the input here to the output, um, I add obviously all the delays of those logical gates, what do I do with the registers? Obviously registers are not instantaneous either, okay? Actually registers, as we will see later, all have typically a clock input. We're going to have edge triggered flip-flops, that's the kind of thing you're using. You have your clock coming in, and on the edge of the clock, the input goes to the output. Okay? So every time it's clocked, clock edge basically causes the input to appear at the output. So what is important here, um, from a timing perspective, is you have a certain clock edge, and then everything starts happening. Clock edge happens, the uh, outputs of the registers change, and it starts to permeate through the logic. So from a register perspective, the only timing thing that I'm really interested in is how much time it takes from my clock input till we basically have here a 50% change at the output of the register, like the normal definition of propagation delay. This delay from the clock edge, the 50% of the clock edge, to the 50% change at the output, we call the C to Q delay. C is the clock, Q is an output of the flip-flop, so the C to Q delay is a delay between the clock edge and the change at the output. So for each timing path, I basically, my critical, the length of my critical path is going to be the delay of all the logic plus the C to Q delay of my register, right? So that's what I want you in phase one when I ask you to evaluate the basic cells, for the adder, you're going to take every input and looking at every output and build timing models. For the register, the only thing I care about is the CQ to Q delay. Okay? For high to low and low to high transitions, which might be different. Okay? That's important. That's the only thing you have to do with the register. Otherwise, don't mess around with them because we haven't talked about registers yet. Okay? That's basically all there is. All the rest is in the definition of the, um, the project. Um, we'll also spend some time on some of those issues that I discussed here in the discussion sessions next week. So you get all prepared for that. And, and the first phase, by the way, is due April 2nd. That's a Wednesday. Okay? The weekend, uh, the Wednesday after spring break. Any other questions? Good. Alrighty, let's see, uh, go forward again, can we, thank you. So I already mentioned all those things. Oh, by the way, remember, you want to get a regrade, time sticking, if they figure out you were unfairly treated in the grading, you have time till Wednesday, during my office hours, after my office hours, that's it. Okay.
So uh, last lecture, we spent quite a bit of time on discussing wrapping up logical effort. And then we started talking about full adders or adders. And um, that's what we're going to do. Most of today is going to be on adders. And then, depending upon timing, I would like to start talking about some other logic families. And that's what we're going to do, the topic of the next couple of lectures. Again, this might be relevant for your project, because in phase two and three of the project, in phase one, you get complementary CMOS gates. In phase three, you might get something different. You might do something different. You might want to do dominant CMOS logic, or NORA CMOS, or pass transistor logic. Your choice. Uh, I'm going to give you that freedom to choose how you would implement your adder cells. Okay? But right now, complementary. Okay, since where we were at the end of last lecture, said full adder, so you have an adder, n-bit adder, typically is built out of full adder cells. And a full adder cell is an adder cell that has three inputs, A, B, and C in, two outputs, C out, and sum. And to figure out what to do here, we see, we give you the true table, which expresses the uh, outputs as a function of the inputs. There's three inputs, so you should have eight rows in my true table. Now, uh, to kind of help, and uh, this might be, look kind of uh, bizarre at this point in time, but later on you will see this bit very interesting. You can also define some intermediate signals. Intermediate signals, which are only a function of A and B, not from the incoming carry. Okay, things that I have from the time I know the input, I can compute them. And we have three different signals we can identify. We have the delete signal, which is the happening when A and B are zero. When A and B are zero, independent of the carry in, the carry out is going to be zero. So you break the carry propagation. Same thing when A and B are one, independent of the incoming carry, the output carry will be one. You will always have an output carry. We call this the generate condition. And then in between, when either A or B is equal to 1. In that case, this is A plus B. No, sorry, A X or B. If, when you look at A X or B, we see that an incoming carry will propagate. We see that the output carry is equal to the input carry. It's a condition that when a carry comes in, we just take it and move it to the next one. That's what we call propagate. So we have these three intermediate signals. The nice thing about those things is they are not a function of the input carry, so I can compute them right away. They're all sitting there, and then the carry comes in, and then I can get that carry as fast as possible to the next stage, which is the art of fast adder design. Uh, we'll come back to that later. OK. Here's uh, the expressions of the carry out. Carry out is when two of the inputs are one, or three. Two or three of the inputs are one, we have a carry out. The sum is the XOR of A, B, and C, I. It means that either one or three of the input bits are going to be one. Right? That's what the carry is. Okay? All right. So I have the equations. We're done. Right? If I look logical equations, I start building gates. And that's what I will do right away. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We have already defined this. Oh, by the way, I have defined these three variables, G, P, and D, uh, or kill or delete. And remember the definitions, generate is A and B. Uh, kill is A and B invert. That's wrong. It should be, uh, you get a kill when both E, A, and B are low. And propagate is XOR A and B. Okay? So the nice thing about those intermediate signals now is that I can rewrite my output expressions. For instance, the sum of a, the sum output bit cannot be written as the XOR of the propagate signal and the CI signal. What it really says is the following thing. If propagate is zero, sum is going to be equal to zero. Uh, sorry, so you have to be P or CI equal to one. One of the two has to be one for getting a sum signal. That's not that important. Really important is this one here. You see that the output carry is now can be rewritten as a function of two elements. Output carry is going to be one when I either have a generate condition, when you have a generate, you're guaranteed to have an output carry, or when you have a propagate condition and the input carry is equal to one. 
So this rewrites my other equation in a very simple format. That's really the crux of adder design, is really making sure that the CO as a function of CI is going to be as fast as possible. Okay? And it's a rewrite equation. And the nice thing about this is I said P and G can be computed in advance. You, for every bit, I can compute P and G right away, and then I just have to wait for the incoming carrier to decide what I'm going to do. Okay? Um, notice that sometimes, most of the time, we're going to define propagate as A, X, or B. In some cases, we can do some tricks, because obviously when I have a, F, um, a propagate can also be written as an X or as an R of A and B. What that means is that you're going to get an output carry if you have a generate condition or if you either A or B is equal to 1. So that's kind of a simpler way of writing it. It could be it avoids an XR, but it makes some other things a little bit more complex. So for the time being, let's stick to those decisions here. I will tell you when I'm using the other definition. So here's the problem of adder design. So I have full adder. Now I want to make a 128-bit uh, adder. OK? Well, how would I do that? Well, it's very simple. I take, I take my full adder, and I have my first bit, 0, the LSB, least significant bit. I take my data in here, and I get an output carry. That output carry feeds into the next adder, which feeds in the next adder, feeds in the next adder, feeds in the next adder, and so on and so forth for 128 bits. If I ask you where is the critical part, it's obvious, right? Uh, the worst case condition is when I create a carry right here at the first bit, and then all the other bits are in propagate condition. Suppose all of those have 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Uh, you can see that the ink outcome carry from this thing here is going to propagate all the way through to the end. So it's only when so the critical part is really come from here and ripples all the way from bit to bit to bit to bit to bit to bit till the end and finally to the sum bit there. So as a result, it's obvious to see that the propagation delay of this adder is going to be proportional to the number of bits. The more bits I have, the longer my critical path becomes. And that's kind of annoying, right? If I really want to do this high-performance computer, uh, I want to build one of those uh, itaniums or something like that, 64-bit processors. Uh, very often, I work with double precision in the ALU, which means I need a 128-bit adder. That's a very long timing path, and it's going to dominate the clock speed of my processor. So the art really is what to do about this. How can we change it in such a way that this block becomes as fast as possible? And especially, we're going to worry about this path here, the carry in to the carry out, because that has to be fast. If we can make this short, then the ripple is going to happen really, really, really fast. An incoming bit kind of zips through from stage to stage quite rapidly. The other part from A to, to, to the carry or B to the carry or to the CIS out is not as important because it occurs only one time. It's really that long chains of carries that I worry about. So good adder designers are going to spend all their effort on the carry path. Don't spend too much time on optimizing the sum generation part because it's a fairly small fraction of your overall delay. Right? That's another rule. Work on the things that are important and don't spend time on things where things which basically don't have an impact. And we'll see that over and over in design that it's going to be repeated. OK. Here's my um, first design. So I know about Boolean logic and all complementary CMOS. And I take the equations, and I implement my adder. So I say, well, gee, I have to make my carry out quite fast. So I just take the equation, which remember that's a carry out is AB plus ACI plus BCI invert. And not, not invert. No inverting here at all. Uh, it's AB plus ACI plus BCI. That's the definition of an equation. So that's exactly what I do here. I take complementary logic. And this is my pull down network, symmetrical network, a dual network on the top. And then obviously this is inverting. I need another inverter to create a carry out. Okay? So that's the straightforward logic implementation. 
And if you would do it that way in a top-notch design, you probably won't get any grade for this. It's exactly the slowest possible implementation I probably can come up with. It's pretty hard to beat that one in terms of badness because it is slow. <laughs> um, think about it. Um, again, remember a couple of rules. And by the way, what I do here to save some transistors, instead of making the output sum only a fair, fair input of the A, B, and C, I, I'm going to rewrite a little bit so that I also take the input C, O, bar as an input to this gate here, allows me to save some transistors. So that's the good part. I rewrote the equations a little bit and I wrote the sum as a function of CI, A, B, and CO, because we have CO already computed anyhow. So it helps me to cut some transistors. Overall count of transistors is 28. So remember that. Um, it's a good thing to, to kind of uh, use a reference, because what we're going to do here and there is shave off transistors. So I, we don't need that device. It's not good. Now, why is this bad? Well. A couple of things. There's some good things in this design. Uh, at least there was something that was done right. Remember when you have the critical path, in this case the critical path is the input carry to the output carry, there was one rule about the placement of the transistor on the critical path. Right? Remember that? Beginning of last lecture, end of the lecture before that. You want to place those transistors as close as possible to the outputs. So this is good. You see that the CI transistors connect directly to the output. A and B have arrived before that. They're already there. So this node here is pre-discharged, if needed to. So this is going to be fast. If you would have put CI at the bottom, it would have even be worse. OK? But then you still see that if I now have to charge up this, uh, discharge this node here, I have to discharge it to two transistors in series. I have a series connection of two devices here. OK? So that's kind of some stacking devices. Um, if I can get around that, it would be nice. Actually, a worthwhile effort is to compute, if to really get an idea of how fast this thing would be, the best thing is basically to compute the logical effort of the carry, from the carry into the carry out. That's a good number, right? Logical effort gives you an idea of how hard this gate has to work to drive the subsequent gate. We'll come back to that later. So, um, here's a fairly simple modification of the adder. I just messed around with the equations a little bit and my transistor things a little bit. And um, I come up with a structure which already is, it still has 28 transistors, but it's already faster. Now, if you look at this, this thing violates our complementary CMOS requirements. Remember, PMOS dual network of the NMOS device. Um, this thing actually realized that some of the transistors in this network were kind of redundant. We actually can eliminate them without too much of a hassle. And the best way to understand this is to go back to your understanding of a full adder implementation. What do we need? You have either a generate or a kill or a propagate condition. Right? Well, a generate condition happens when A and B are 1. So what we should do when A or B and 1, the only thing I just say, OK, I'm going to pull down this node to 0, invert it, I get a carry out. That's a generate condition. A kill condition happens when A or B are low, in which case the carry output has to be 0. So in that case, we use that network. So this is kill or delete. This is generate. We've taken care of that part already. A very simple understanding. The nice thing about this thing is that it's purely symmetrical. It's a symmetrical network. It's not any more dual. It's really a mirror of the other one. By the way, we call this the mirror adder for a good apparent reason. And then, what we said is that if there's a propagate, what we should do is take the input carry and feed it directly to the output carry. So that's exactly what this thing does here. The propagate, remember, can be implemented as A, X, or B. But actually, it's also valid to say that the propagate is A plus B. Uh, when either A or B is high, any input carry will go to the output. OK? So that's what we do here. This implement this network is A or B. And the same thing here for the negative values. When A and B are low, 
uh, we basically won't have a problem. And then, if you look at this, from this point on, this is simply inverter, right? Uh, if, it, it, if, if this is one, for instance, this network is on, this is just going to be an inverter inverting the input carry and moving it to the output, just propagating. So when you have a propagated condition, we enable this inverter to operate, OK? Mm, once you P, which is equal to A plus B is equal to 1, input carry comes in. If it's a 1, it goes to this path. If it's a 0, it comes to this path and goes to the output. OK? So this is quite beautiful. A um, uh, number of things, like if you look at this structure here, it's fully symmetrical. PMOS and NMOS networks. And it also has reduced the load on the devices. Actually, in order to understand that, you have to look a bit at logical effort type of analysis. To see, actually, I can claim right away that this thing is going to be faster than my previous implementation. Just looking at logical effort type of uh, analysis. Um, now, I think the next slide probably helps me to work. Let me just see. It's right here. Uh, we'll come back to that later and basically do the precise analysis because in order to compute, well, no, logical effort is actually quite easy. Uh, but it's a propagation delay and a fan out and things like that is, is something that you have to combine the two factors. So just look at logical effort. The logical effort for A and B in this case are going to be what? Right? If I look at this gate, logical effort is, remember, compares the, um, uh, given the same resistance, what the input capacitance going to be. So in order to size these things, uh, we're probably going to make this thing 2, 2, 4, 4. Um, this is going to be 2, 2, 2, 4, 4. Right? So the input capacitors I see on this particular gate can be easily, com if you do the analysis of LA and LB, uh, logical efforts here, we see that for node A, we see a total input capacitance which is equal to 2 plus 2 plus 4 plus 4. Right? That's the input capacitance. And you divide this by 3 to compare with an inverter. So that's the logical effort for nodes A and B. For CI, what I see is 2 plus 4, uh, let me just check, that's, and that's it. So it's 6 over 3. And this logical structure, if you look at this structure, the overall logical effort for the input carry is half of for the A and B signals, which is exactly what I would like to see. Um, CI is the critical signal, so I want to make sure that its logical effort is substantially smaller than for the A and B parts. So that's already good news. I managed to already differentiate between CI and A and B. OK? So what else can I do to optimize the design? So first thing is manipulate the equations a bit, make them simpler. Like we did with the mirror adder, we kind of got rid of a number of transistors overall, resulting in an improvement of logical effort. But they're still annoying, right? If I think about this, one of the key annoying factors with this design is that the critical part first goes to this very complex gate and then has to go to this inverter, which adds to my propagation delay, right? I don't like that at all. Is there a way for me to speed up that path? I really would like to get rid of the inverter. But that's impossible in theory because a CMOS gate Complementary symbols gate is always inverting. And by if you look at the equations, you see that the carry equations are non-inverting. So what do we do? Well, here's an interesting observation. It turns out that I could take a full adder cell and I invert, invert all the inputs. So I have my equation S is equal to function A, B, C, I. What's happening? If I now would invert all the inputs, OK, um, I just flip them all around. What's going to happen with the output? It could be anything. Turns out that the adder has this very beautiful property that the outcome is really the inverted value of the sum 
when I would basically put A, B, and C in there. Okay? And the same thing is true with the carry. So it's an interesting property. It says this structure is exactly the same as this structure, where you have those inversions. Now, I say, okay, that's cool, because now what I could do is, let's say, if I use this for bit zero, for bit one, I can just connect CO of this element. Remember, you have to, uh, remember that we have this extra inversion? If I eliminate that extra inversion, I get CO bar in here. And I connect it directly to a cell where all the inputs are inverted. I get back again CO, and so on and so forth. And so I can actually, in, by doing so, by alternating between this cell and the next cell, I can actually eliminate all those inverters on my carry forward path. Okay? So that's pretty cool because it allows me to in, eliminate a complete stage in my carry propagation path. So remember, Typically, you will get C A E bar. Uh, we get C out by limiting the inverted. I get the inverted value. I feed this into the next gate. Um, that would give it basically give me C O. I eliminate this inversion. I again back, get back into right shift. Yes. And by inverting the input, do you mean switching the pull up and pull down networks? Now the inverting of of this here. Now it's it's applying A bar, B bar, and C O bar as the input. So you have a gate, like here. And as I mentioned, you have a gate S, A, B, C. Invert the inputs mean that instead of applying A, B, C, I just apply A bar, B bar, and C bar. Doesn't that take an inverter at the input? Yes, I put an inverter at the input. But, but the inverters are, no, I totally agree. So let's say that I put inverter at the input. Now, remember, we chain those things together. So I start with stage one, and I put in here A, B, let's say, and C, I. But what I'm going to do is uh, I'm not going to implement the inverter. So out of this, I will get C, O, bar. I'm going to feed this into a next cell where I take C, O, bar. That's okay. We already have the inverted value there for free. I just have to invert A and B at this stage. But that's, I don't care, right? Those are not the critical ones. The critical ones are not the one with critical path. So the same thing here, this, if we can imply all the inverted values, like as we said, we take the inverted values, we get the inverted value of the carry. But again, I eliminate my inverter, and it flips, so I can now go to the same cell again. So what I just do is on the odd and the even slices, I use different cells. And by this way, I can get rid of all the inversions on the critical path, which is nice. It's a good feature. Simple trick. But you have to know it. Somebody invented it, figured it out at some point in time, and sure enough, everybody does it now. For every adder, that's what we do. Okay? So that's the trick, as I show here. First bit, and, and you can see you get basically invert, invert. There's two inverters cancel out. Same here. Um, you have non-invert, non-invert. You basically two inverts basically cancel out, and so on and so forth. And as a result of that, no inverters on the whole forward chain. This is what's called the inversion property. So that's something we always do. OK. So let's go back to our mirror adder. And I've uh, changed it a little bit around. So what I did now is invert. I got rid of two inverters. I got rid of the inverters on the carry path. And I got rid of the inverter that was sitting here at the S part. So instead of 28 transistors, now I'm down to 24 transistors. OK. And um, for the carry part, as we mentioned here, the logical effort is equal to 2, as we already computed before. It's 6 divided by 3. Right? 4 plus 2 divided by 3. Now let's look at the propagation delay of this thing. Remember how the way you compute propagation delay? You look, have to look at fan out times basically the logical effort. OK, so that's worth while exploring. So let's look at the whole structure. Let's do some sizing, actually. So um, how would I size my, here's my meter adder. This is one stage. This feeds into the next stage. That's stage number two. Right? Uh, we're going to assume that P MOSs are twice as large as N MOSs. So that's easy. 
So I would like to figure out what the critical timing paths are going to be and what, um, what the overall delay is going to be in this structure. Or what should, how should I size this in such a way that I get minimum delay? Remember, to have optimum delay to many, many stages, what do I have to have? A fan out of four, right? If I can get to a fan out of four, that will be ideal. Okay, so well, let's do some exercise here. The sum path, as I said, I don't care about the sum path. I'm not going to do any sizing there. I'm just going to make my devices minimum size. Uh, I'm still obviously going to size them up in such a way that when I put the serial connections together, I double devices. So let's say for this thing here, 333 for the PMOS 666, right? This is straightforward minimum size, has the same logical effort as, or the same delay basically as an inverter, okay? All right, so that's given. So let's not start to get, I said I want to get a logical effort um, of the carry, the logical effort of the carry gate we know, that's two. I want to get a fan out of four, right? I want to get a effort or, or overall, not fan out, but stage effort of four. That's the optimal number. So that means that the electrical fan out should be equal to what? Two, right? So logical effort over this path, that's the one we're trying to optimize, is two. Uh, remember uh, that stage effort or effective fan out is equal to logical effort times F, right? This I would like to see equal to four. We know the log logical effort is four. So we want to make sure that we size this whole structure in such a way that F is equal to two, the electrical fan out. The ratio between the input capacitance on this node and the input capacitance at this node should be equal to factor two. That's something that would give me the optimal design. Okay, so how do we get there? Well, what we have to first figure out is what's the fan out capacitance, okay? Uh, fan out capacitance is gonna be equal to, you see this CI here connects to a whole bunch of places. Well, there's a nine here, and there's four here, and there's two here. That's six. I have another factor. This connects to this here and this here. So you have six plus six plus nine. That's already my load capacitance, right? My load capacitance is nine equivalent input gate capacitances. Plus one more extra factor here, which is this capacitance, CCI. But CCI is the same thing as this capacitor here, and it's really going to be dependent upon how I size my, my transistors, okay? So what should CCI be in such a way that I get an electrical fan out of two? That's really what I need, because C load, remember fan out, electric fan out equal to two? So what I can say is that C load, the load capacity output, should be two times the capacitance at the input here. So that's an extra constraint that I'm putting down. I can solve this equation, which says actually that CCI should be equal to six plus six plus nine, it drops off one, is equal to 21. So that's the way I should size my transistors. If I make CCI equals 21, I will have a total load here of 42, which is in lack of and an overall stage effort of four, okay? So that basically gives me the last question here is how do I size this thing such a way that I get 21? Um, and this can be accomplished by choosing now as follows. If I now take this thing seven, this 14, that's 21, right? I, you have to make your PMOS twice as large as the NMOS, so I get a 21 load, and then you size the other transistors equally to get your traditional sizing going. So this is a very simple example of how I could use logical effort and logical effort analysis to figure out how to size this CMOS adder to get to the optimal possible delay. And since I know, if I know now what the TP is equal to your parasitic effort plus logical effort times the fan out, we know that this is going to be equal to 21. For this, we can compute, uh, this is a, um, we would have to analyze, but it's going to be approximately equal to two. So we know that our stage delay is going to be approximately 23 per stage going to this adder. It's a good reference because now I could start comparing it with some of the previous structures and see how much I gained. So, 
The summary of the mirror adder, it's um, some interesting properties. Number one, CMOS and PMOS change are completely symmetrical. That's important. Laying out the cell is reducing the capacitance of that CO. That's very important. When you do the sizing and the layout, you want to make sure that that note there, that inter internal note, this one here, that's the most critical note in the network. I want to make sure that all the wiring and extra capacitors and diffusions are all sized in such a way that I made this capacitor as small as possible, because it's a critical one. Carry signals are critical. We already mentioned that. Place the eye close to the output. We should know that by now. And also, as I remember, all the transistors and the propagate carry chain have to be optimized for speed. And, and that's the only ones. Because if I would be starting sizing up my sum structure for speed, I make my transistors bigger, I put actually more load on my carry path. And I slow that one down, which is, would be a disastrous thing. So, Take your sum generation and make it as simple as possible, minimum size, and focus on the transistors and the carry path for optimization. Okay, now, that's good, but not very satisfactory. So what I did is here, I said, okay, I take this ripple adder, I'm not gonna play some games, I eliminate the inverters, and then I use this mirror structure, and I optimize my transistor size to make it as fast as possible. Very standard logical optimization strategy. But ultimately, it's still a linear function of the delay, right? That's kind of an unfortunate thing. Um, if I want to go to 128, even I've made every stage faster, I'm still going to get 128 of those delays in my carry path, worst case pile. So obviously, um, anybody who really wants to work on fast adder says, is there a way to get around that? Is there a way for me to make an adder which is faster than linear in terms of the number of bits. Wouldn't that be nice? Could I make something that is maybe um, square root of the number of bits? Or maybe a log number of bits? Or something that's totally independent of the number of bits? That would be nice, right? I can make a huge adder and it's always the same speed, independent of how many bits I have. So this is where this 1,500 million papers have come from in adder design. That's the holy grail of adder design, is trying to come up with a new structure which is gonna be faster than the other one, and basically breaks that linear dependency. So there's some really very clever ideas in there, and let me just walk to some of those in the next set of slides. Uh, here's one that everybody struggles with at first sight. Uh, it's a fairly simple thing, but it, virtually everyone who sees it for the first time is said, hmm, that's kind of bizarre. But it helps. Let me give you an example. Suppose I have four bits in our series here. I, I have a four-bit adder block. Okay. Worst case path would be when all those four bits would be in propagate condition. Right? Because then this incoming carry from the previous bit has to go to one, to them, to them, to them, to them, to the output. Right? Has to go to four stages. Now, what I could do is it's 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 called this is called a bypass adder. It's a very good example of why you call it a bypass adder. Um, the way I always explain it is, think about a big city. Right? I want to I go to a big city. You either can go to the center of the town and all the small routes and all the traffic lights, or I can take the bypass route, the freeway that goes around the city, and hop around it and ignore the city altogether. No traffic lights, no stops. Right? Uh, that's obviously only true when you can afford to basically miss the center of the town. Now, when can we miss the center of the town in this case? When all the conditions are in propagate, I know that this input carry is gonna go to the output because it's all in propagate condition. So if P0, P1, P2, and P3 are gonna be one, I actually can take a bypass and take the carry right away to the output via multiplexer. A multiplexer is something that chooses between two inputs, depending if its value is zero or one, okay? Obviously, this internal carries will still happen, but will won't propagate because the multiplexer is set in this condition. Under all under conditions, there's gonna be no, if of the four propagates, one of them is zero, there's gonna be no propagation path between input and output, and we have actually no worries to make 
about the long path. Actually, we might have a kill here or a generate, and that's going to be the beginning of a new stretch. But it breaks the path. So by basically addressing only the critical path by using this single thing here, uh, we can be faster. Now, there's obviously one condition. This thing is obviously taking, this is a complex gate, P0, P1, P2, P3. Uh, that requires, obviously, if you make this more and more complex, the delay of that gate is going to get shorter, swap, bigger and bigger. So this is going to help you to determine how many bits I want to put in one proper gate section. But in reality, now what I replace the delay of this, 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 and this by delay of a single multiplexer. Okay, that's not enough. All right, so what I can do now, I take my 128-bit adder, and I divide it in chunks of four, or chunks of eight and use every time this little bypass route to get around it. Now, the million dollar question is, did I say changes the perspective? Is it still linear? Is it square root? Is this logarithmic? Is this flat? What do you think? If you look at the overall propagation delay of this adder, this long adder, if I look at the overall worst case path, will it still be a linear function of n, the number of bits? Or really, have we changed fundamentally what the dependency is? No, right? It's still linear. Right? Because, but, but it's faster linear. It has a different slope. It's faster linear because here I have my per block, I have four propagate delays. While here I have only one multiplexer. So your propagation delay to your critical path is now going to be m which is equal to n over k times t max, right? n is the number of bits, k is the number of blocks. So, sorry, is the number of bits per block, so I have n blocks. Um, wait a second. So t max, yeah, n over k is uh, the number of blocks I have times the t max time. Okay? But still linear. So, it's a nice feature. I'm, I'm happy about it. Um, and it actually works quite nicely. So this is the way you would implement this. So let's say I take a 16-bit adder. I divide it in blocks of four. Uh, we have a crack, core, traditional carry propagation path. And we have our sum path. But as, as mentioned, for every four bits, we have now an extra multiplexer. And um, then uh, this is going to be driven by the what we call the block propagate condition for this block. The block propagate is a product of all the propagate signals on the individual bits. Now, you look at the propagation delay, I can expect it. So, there's um, the inputs come in. The critical path now is going to go like this, right? The inputs come in. This is supposed to be zero, this first bit. Inputs come in, they go and propagate over through this block. You have to propagate first, you have to figure out there's a carry at the first output block. You go to a multiplexer. For every subsequent block, you go to the multiplexer to the last block, because here I don't care anymore what's coming out of there. I have to generate the sum, so I go from here to the output. So my propagation delay is going to be equal where n is the number of um, total number of inputs, and m is the number of uh, bits in a block. So we have t set up is the first delay. In this block, I have m minus 1, I have m bits. At m is the number of bits in a block. If you think about how many carry propagates do I have, it's m minus 1. So there's m minus 1 t carries. Then I have to go to n minus 1 or n over m minus 1 stages of repeat block. Like in this case, it's n divided by 4 is basically three, 3 multiplexers. That's really what it says, 3 times t max. Plus finally, propagating through this block to the last bit and then it something. So you get m minus 1 t carry again plus t sum. And that's your critical path. But the most important part here is that n is now divided by m. Uh, it's still linear as a function of n, but the slope of n is now divided by m. Okay, that's a good feature. Still, not very happy about this thing. It's still linear. And means if I want to do a thousand bit adder, it's going to be done slow. I would like to get something that's faster. So let's think about another approach, um, another strategy to tackle it. Um, 
what if I take a block? Like we do in this approach here, you have blocks. We don't know for a block down the chain, we don't know exactly what the carry input is going to be. That's really the problem. If I would know what the carry input is, I can start computing. But I don't know. So I have to wait till it comes all the way down that chain and say, OK, it's a 0, now I do that. If it's a 1, I do that. So we could do something like we, people have done in computer architecture and things like that. Let's not wait. Let's assume both. If I say, OK, it could be a 0, what would happen if the input would be a 0? And in parallel, what I'm going to compute is the assumption that's in 1. I'm actually going to put both of them in parallel. So I'm not going to wait. I compute both paths. And then when the real carry comes in, I just have to select the output of one or the other one. Right? Because I have everything pre-computed. Everything is sitting there. Once the carry comes in, I say, bingo, I'm going. OK? Uh, that's called the carry select adder for obvious reason. You basically pre-compute, and then you select based on what the actual input is. I already showed that. So here's the idea. So again, you have your setup. Setup basically computes, propagate, and, and, and generate signals. That, that's, I can do this right away. I have my inputs A and B come in. Over the whole adder, I can compute all those P and Gs simultaneously. No problem. Then as I said, per block of N, let's say four bits, I can do assume that the input is a zero carry, and I can assume that the input is a one carry. Okay? And I compute both. So I have two results. And then finally, incoming carry comes in, I feed it to a multiplexer. I basically choose using a multiplexer, I choose either the result of this or this and send it to the output. And then I finally can compute the sum. Okay? So that's an example of using parallelism to do your computation. Again, million dollar question, is this still linear? Have I changed anything fundamentally with this approach? What do you think? Still linear, darn, you're right. Because I still have, per block, I have one multiplexer. So I have to go to n over m, where the m is the number of blocks, uh, n over m, which is the number of blocks, times the T max. However, this is now where ingenious, genius strikes, right? So, well, maybe I can do something better than that. Think about it, right? So I'm having here those blocks. I set up this thing, all those things, I have n blocks. For every block, I actually I can compute all those things in advance. They're all happening in parallel. Block 0, block 1, block 2, block 3, block 4. Inputs come in, I do the setup, and I do this carry propagation for a 0 and a 1. Okay? So this all happens at the same time, and the outputs of all those things are going to be available at the same time. Now, if I now look at block number 2 or block number 3, those outputs are here, and then they're sitting there twisting their thumbs. Right? They have nothing to do, the values are available. And I'm sitting here, I'm waiting for the next block big for this carry to come in. And then the multiplexer fires. So we're losing time. We're sitting there waiting for that thing to happen. So if I know, so well, gee, since I have extra time, why not make this block a little bit wider? I have more time anyhow, so why not do five bits in block number two? So first block, four bits. Do five in the next one. And as a result of that, I delay the output a little bit of the up of this block, but that's okay because the carry is not there anyhow. So what I'm starting to do is balancing out my timing paths. And the next block could be six. And then afterwards could be seven and eight bits per block. So you gradually make your blocks longer and longer and longer. Now, again, what does that do to us? I'll think about it. By doing so, suddenly for the same matter, I'm going to need less blocks. Less blocks means less multiplexers. Less smaller number of multiplexers in the chain, potentially faster. Okay? How much faster? Well, that's tricky. We have to analyze that. So, but this is the idea of the of the carry select adder. 
if I would basically make every block the same length, this is block number one, and then goes to here, and then goes to the multiplex, and finally to the sum, right? But as I said, you can see that those, all those signals here are available at the same time. So by making this four to eight bits, and this nine to 13 bits, and this 14 to 18 bits, so gradually I make my blocks wider and wider and wider. Okay, I can start balancing the arrival time of this signal and this signal. In the ideal world, I would like to see both of them exactly at the same time arriving at the input of the multiplexer. It means I'm not wasting any time. Okay, and that's really what we do with this more sophisticated structure. Oh no, this is the linear part still. This is where I now start going from, this is 2-bit, 3-bit, 4-bit, 5-bit, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not going to go to, to complete analysis on this, but if you basically take this for a very large adder, you will see that the number of stages that I'm going to need is not anymore n over m, but actually the square root of 2n. So you still have t set up, you have to carry through this thing, so m times t carry, you go to this block finally, and you have to have somewhere a t sum. But this is the key element here. Suddenly, I've gone from a linear dependency on the number of bits to a square root dependency of the number of bits. And for every one of you who's ever plotted a square root, you know that linear goes like this, and square root goes like that. So, and actually, if you go to longer and longer adders, you can see that it's almost going to plateau out and flatten out. It's not going to change. Going from uh, 1,000 to 2,000 bits is not going to change that much in terms of the propagation delay of your adder because it's square root of 2,000, square root of 1,000. Okay? Now, here's an interesting question that you can ask yourself. That's a nice trick, right? That's very clever. Could I use the same thing for the carry bypass adder? Remember the carry bypass adder? We did the same thing, blocks, and then little multiplexers. Um, and the answer is actually yes. If you're really careful, you can design the carry bypass adder so that it also becomes a quadratic or a square root type of dependency. That's a little bit more tricky. And I'll leave that as an exercise to you what you would do, but it can give you a hint. In a carry bypass structure, you want to make it square root. The block you're going to make the longest is not the one at the end, but the one in the middle. Okay, so you start with small, you go larger and larger and larger in the middle, and then you start making them smaller again. And I'll leave that as an exercise to you to figure out why. Think about it. Uh, it's actually not that hard. It's, there's some small but subtle difference between how the carry select works and the carry bypass works. Okay, very neat. So rip ladder, like this, linear select, like this, square root select, quadratic. Okay, that's already quite important. Obviously, those things come with an overhead, like a, this multiplex something like that. Don't try to make a four-bit adder using select. Right? That's a really bad idea. The overhead will dominate, and you will be slower than a ripple. So those things only start to make sense when you go to larger and larger adder structures. By the way, project eight bits. Right. So um, it's not going to basically. It might help in one place. It might help, but um, this kind of very bizarre structure might not play a very big role in the project. We're not going to. Uh, yeah, I couldn't do a thirty-two bit. It would be simulating on Spectre for years. So that's why we basically pick it on eight bit word lengths. Okay. Now, here's some other thought. I said, I really would like to make the fastest possible adder. What would be the fastest possible structure I can make? Nobody has ever proven this. I've never seen a proof that you cannot make an adder that's faster than this. But uh, through a whole bunch of experience, people designing a whole bunch of different structures, they actually figured out that the fastest way you can make an adder is not square root of n, but actually log 2 of n. That's the fastest structure. And um, um, the best way to explain this is as follows. It's kind of a little overlap. This figure kind of run around a little bit. But um, let's think about this way. Suppose I would have the um, 
It's my propagate equations. Uh, one thing I could do is this. I can start saying, I, if I really want to make something fast, what I could do is say, well, the carry propagate path, so remember that the propagate, or the carry out, is equal to the carry in times a generate plus P, uh, sorry, uh, no, wrong, is generate plus P times CI, right? For every bit, we have that equation. So, well, no, what I'm going to do is um, take two bits together. Right? If I take two bits together, I can write that CO is going to be equal of CO2 is going to be equal to G2. Um, yeah, let's do that. G2 plus P2 times G1 plus P times P1 times C0 in. Okay? I can actually kind of nest these equations. All right, so I take one input carry and I do the computation for the output carry in one gate. I could keep on doing that. Right? I say, okay, let's take four bits. I take a carry in and I make one large gate and I get the output value. I can do eight bits, one large gate, which is really this G plus P nested G plus P nested G plus P nested G plus P. Uh, one giant logical expression, which gives me the output carry as a function of the input carry for a thousand bits. Could do that, right? Huge logical block. One gate, though. I can all nest this very nicely. Should be able to work, right? And that might be the, and you might, you might make the argument that if I do so, my delay between my input is going to be fixed. Right? There's basically a one gate delay between input and output. So I have found an adder which has a propagation delay which is not a function of the size of the adder. But you forgot about logical effort. Right? Obviously, if I try to make this giant gate, it's going to have 1,000 transistors stacked on top of each other, n MOSs, and 1,000 p MOSs on top of each other. And we know that that's not linear. Actually, it's quadratic. You're actually going to be slower than your ripple adder when you do so. So that's not a good idea. Uh, but it gives you some ideas of maybe I can do something clever. Why not start doing things in a hierarchical fashion? Okay? If I have 16 bits, why not divide it into subgroups? So I have, let's say, bit 0 and 1. I can combine it together and I can define what the, under what conditions there would be a propagate condition for this block and a generate condition for this block, right? It's what we call the block propagate and the block generate conditions, okay? So a block generate for this, when will the block like this generate for sure a bit is well, when bit zero, there's two bits, zero and one, then bit zero has a generate and there's a propagate in bit one or does it generate in position one? then you're guaranteed that the output carry of this block is going to be 1, right? Block propagate is easy. To have a block propagate, both bit 0 and bit 1 have to be in the propagate condition, okay? Now, I can do the same thing for bit 2 and 3, same thing for bit 4 and 5, and so on and so forth, okay? So I divide my inputs into block groups of 2, and for each of those, I compute a higher level propagate condition. Now, when will these four bits have a propagate condition? Well, to have a propagate condition for the four bit, it's essential that block one is in has a block propagate of one and block two has a propagate of one. So I can combine those values using the next level block, which is exactly the same function, logical function to compute a four bit propagate condition 4-bit generate condition. And now I can do this again, do this for 8 bits and for 16 bits and so on and so forth. What I do really is create a hierarchical tree. You start with two blocks, you make it block, four blocks, eight blocks, 16, 32, 64, and so on and so forth. But now, these are blocks which has a fixed logical effort. Right? We know the logical effort is fairly straightforward. There's two input, three input. So we know that. And the number of stages here is how many? 
So we have a block which is fairly fast in itself, and then we stage a number of stages. And that's going to determine how fast we can predict there's going to be input to output carry condition. Now, if you do a tree structure, do you, what do you think the overall number of stages is going to be? Uh, let's say I have n input bits. What's going to be the input to output delay? Log n. That's exactly right. So if I have eight inputs, I'm going to do it with three stages. Log 2n of 8 is 3. If I have 16, it's four stages. If it's 64, five stages. Suddenly you can see that I can do very complex things by very nicely building those particular trees. And that's really the idea of what we call logarithmic or tree adders. We take sub-blocks and we then kind of hierarchically construct them together into more complex structures. Now, you, you have to be a little bit careful because now, obviously, when I do this, I have my PG, my PG, my PG. I finally can say, I get the output carry here. I get my input carry. I can say what the output carry is going to be in one shot. I just have to go to this tree, and I know C7. So that's cool. I know what the output carry but that obviously doesn't give me the result. In order to result, I also now have to know, obviously, what the carrier position 0 is, 1, 2, 3, and 4. But the good news is, is that I can find this by combining some of those intermediate signals. You have this tree here. And then by, for instance, saying, well, do we have an output carrier at bit 1? Well, I can find this here. An output bit uh, at carrier 2, well, I take the result here with the propagate and generate of 2, and I find that, and so on and so forth. And if you look at this, this is just like an inverted tree in the other direction. It's again a tree. But it goes and gets more and more complex towards the output nodes, number of stages. But fundamentally, for every one of those bits, the number of stages I have to go to is log 2n. So you have the forward tree, you have the reverse tree. Okay. So that's cool. And by the way, this is the fastest thing you will get. There's no way to get faster than that. Log 2n is the best thing you can do for an adder, OK? Now this, however, that's not the end of the story. Because now I say, OK, should I use blocks of 2? Or should I use blocks of 4 or 8? What is the number of bits I'm going to combine per stage? It's a variable for me as well. Because log 4 of n is obviously smaller than log 2 of n. So if I take blocks of 4 and combine them together, it should be faster. But then every individual block gets more complex. So it's a trade-off. And you have to be very careful on how uh, you choose that particular number. This is called the radix of the adder. So you will see that you take a paper about the Itanium processor. You go to the ISSC proceedings. Uh, those guys are always very proud about their adders. Uh, there's always going to be descriptions of, well, gee, this is going to be a radix 4 type of Brent Kong or coggy stone adder structure, uh, something like that. And uh, the difference really between those is, is quite subtle, but there's some differentiation. So there's many ways to construct a tree. And the, why do, and the, the way we construct them is named after the people who first came up with them. So coggy stone is Mr. Coggy. And stone basically wrote a paper at some point in time, so it's called coggy stone. Brent Kong is obviously Brent and Kong. Uh, so they basically, that's the way. And then there's the other factor, each for those, both for Brent Kong, and if, by the way, there's other. Brent Kong, Coggy Stone. For both of them, there's different versions, which is Redix 2, Redix 4. Okay. Now, what's the choices to be made? Well, let me show you some examples here of why it could be different. This is an example of a, um, I think, a 16-bit Brent Kong adder. Kind of does the same thing as we described before. You see a first, this is your carry tree, right? You take blocks of two. By the way, this is a Redix 2 adder because it takes blocks in chunks of two. And so it takes two, takes two, takes two. The next stage, you take two of these results together, you get the next thing. Next thing takes two together, you get two of them, and you finally get the output carry. Right? And then you have the inverse network, which basically taps off those 
and as you can see, it is an inverse tree, you get the output set. Um, lock to n, as we expected, but one little caveat here. The caveat is that if you look at some of those nodes internally, like this node, um, remember delay is dependent not only about the complexity of the logic and logical effort, but it's also fan out. Electrical effort is important. This node is a real loser, right? You think about it, it has this here, this connects, uh, this connects to it, so it has connect to here as well. So it has a fairly large fan out right there. This node is going to be slow because it has to drive a lot of fan out to different places. Um, well, you might do some tricks. You might put some buffers in there, and people have done that. If you have a node that's heavily loaded by putting a little inverter in there or buffer, you can have that life drive that large capacitance. But there might be another option. You say, well, I, I'm going to make it bigger. I'm just, I don't care really about the size of my multi. I really want to be very fast in my adder. So I'm going to put some redundancy in there. But by putting redundancy in there, I'm going to avoid having nodes that have a lot of fan out. It's a trade-off. Size versus fan out. Uh, by the way, this is a Coggy Stone adder with four bits instead of two. Um, no, sorry. This is the Coggy Stone adder. The first one was the Brent Kung. This is Coggy Stone. See what Coggy Stone does? It says, I'm going to repeat the tree. I'm not going to do one forward tree, but I'm going to put a whole bunch of redundant trees. For every bit, I'm going to keep on combining them together. And as a result of that, if you look at it's the same logic structure and the same equations, it has a lot more dots here. There's a lot more of those combining functions. And as a result, this guy is going to cost you in terms of area. But you look at all those nodes, and you see that the fan out is constant. Every node has the same load, which is a lot smaller than what you would see with the Brent Kong type structure. It's par this is parser, obviously, but this one has a smaller and constant fan out. And by the way, this is most often, I think if you really want to do a fast adder, the fastest possible thing, this is a good one to go for. Because this is pretty much as good as it gets. Okay. Now, as I said, you also can choose between Redix 2 versus Redix 4. That's a Redix 4 structure. And different options here. Now this. So this is, for instance, an example of a Coggy Stone uh, Redix 4 type of structure. This is the way we typically draw the things. These diagrams are so complex that you have to kind of abstract it away. You don't put all your gates there. You would never get there. So these are kind of all your propagate generate blocks that you have in there. And you simplify by dot. But you can see there's a challenge here, right? If I would have to design those things, I, I design one little block, which is this PG block, that basically does computes the block propagate and the block generate. That's the only cell I have to design. But then the nightmare is really doing the wiring. Um, designing an adder like this is, the blocks putting your cells down is easy. You can actually kind of nicely massage it in such a way that it becomes a very nice square block. But then you have to sit there and putting all those wires which is very painful. Uh, so those things are not for the light of heart. Uh, it takes a lot of work. Um, if you really want to do, do a fast job, you want to be done quickly, do a ripple adder. That's straightforward. All your bits together, you're done. This is hard work. Uh, but it pays off. If it basically doubles your clock frequency, hey, that means a lot of money. OK. Already. So that's basically uh, what I wanted to say about adders. So, let me um, actually to conclude that is one more thing I would like to say. Um, actually, there's a way to make an adder which is totally independent of the number of bits, uh, where the delay is absolutely not a function of n. It is possible, and um, and people have shown it. It's, I can so people always think you know square root of n or log to n. That's the fastest it gets. In the answer, that's not really true. As I said, I really can build an adder which is, has delay which is independent of the number of bits. I have a 2,000 bits or 800 bits. It's exactly the same delay. The way you do it is very simple. Um, I'm going to do a transformation on my number system. So instead of working with Boolean 0 and 1, 
I'm going to work with a number system which has three values. Minus 1, 0, and 1. And if you do so, you actually can design a carry path which is guaranteed that it's never going to run through. Because the minus 1 might block a 1 of the previous one. So it's actually perfectly legit to do so. This is called carry safe arithmetic or redundant coding, redundant adders. Because you have redundancy here, right? One zero minus one is going to create some redundancy in your representation. I'm going to use that redundancy to make things infinitely fast. <coughs> However, so you might ask yourself, if that's true, why do all those people bother about Calgary Stone and all this stuff? Throw it out of the door and always use this stuff, right? It's not hard to use uh, minus one, zero, and ones, and so on. Oh, sorry, this is a one, not minus one. Um, you know. What's the catch? Well, as long, suppose I have a, a multiplier. Right? Obviously, to store a 1, 0, and minus 1, I need a, it's going to, let's say from a register perspective, I'm not going to store this in a single bit. I'm going to have to have representation. I'm going to probably use two bits. It says, if it's 0, 0, that's 0. If it's 0, 1, that's going to be 1. And 1, 0 is minus 1, or something like that. I have a representation. OK? You can do that. But you can see I need two bits for a bit. So that's one problem already. My register space doubles. OK? So I, definitely in my memories and I.O., things like that, I'm going to work normally binary. OK? Binary, that's something I can do. So here's my binary representation. So if I'm going to go now to this ALU, which uses this carry save approach, I'm going to have to do a transformation from normal binary, 0, 1, to this redundant structure, which is minus 1, 0, and 1. Oops, nothing there. That's in per se not a problem. I can do this fast. The catch comes when you come out of this thing. And I say, I want to go back to binary. It turns out that you need a rip ladder to do so. So at the output, to go back into your transformation, somewhere, somehow, I need something which is going to be depending of log to n, at best. So if you stay around in this block for a long time, you're like your data floats around and floats around and floats around, actually this whole approach helps. But if you really have to go back and forth between the different representations, you lose. So but be aware of that. If somebody says, yeah, the fast is locked to n, say, no, 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 I know a trick. I can do it independent of n. So, and that's carry safe. OK? So uh, next lecture, we're going to start talking about logic. So remember, if you haven't gotten your midterm yet, I have some remaining sitting here.